Hey everyone, if you've lived in the United States your whole life, you probably just like me learned about the pilgrims and the Native Americans coming together to have a feast and that is where our modern day Thanksgiving comes from. Well, that's not entirely true. Today, we're gonna talk about the real history of Thanksgiving. So you may be asking if the first Thanksgiving wasn't that Thanksgiving of 1621 with the Native Americans and the Pilgrims, when was the first American Thanksgiving? Well, that's a little bit tricky, but I'm gonna do my best to try to take you through a timeline of when we first see the words Thanksgiving appear. So the words Thanksgiving start appearing as early as May 1541 in the Texas Panhandle. And the next reference is Florida in 1564, and then in New Finland in 1578, again in Texas in 1598, and then we see one in the Jamestown settlement starting around 1607, and then again in 1610, also in Virginia around 1619, Let's focus on the famous 1621 Pilgrim and Native American Harvest Feast. So we have to give a little back history to really describe this story. At the start of the 17th century, Southern New England was home to a variety of busy communities within several confederations. These were the people of the first light, and they called their home the Dawnland. Political leaders were known as Sachems and had been trading with Europeans for over 100 years before the Pilgrims. Relations soured only after deceitful Europeans kidnapped locals to sell as slaves. Permanent European settlement was impossible due to the already high population of native occupants. But in 1616, tradesmen introduced a disease to the Dawnland, whose inhabitants died in droves from a lack of immunity. In three years, up to 90% were wiped out in several confederations, including the Wampanoag. Their head Sachem, Massasoit, was aware of how close they were to being subjugated by their unafflicted enemy, the Narangaset. He was determined to save his people from such a fate. This was the political world the Pilgrims were about to enter. The Pilgrims would not have been known as Pilgrims to anybody of that era. That was a name that was given to them much later. They were known mainly as like Brownist or Separatist because they wanted to split from the Church of England. They had viewed that it became too Catholic and they wanted a whole new church. Now Puritans agreed with them on that level that the church had became too Catholic, but weren't quite as strict as the Pilgrims of what they were looking for in a new church. And the Pilgrims left England to go to Holland where you did have religious freedom. Now once they were in Holland, they actually began to feel that Holland was a little too liberal for them and they did not want their kids growing up corrupt based off the Holland people's beliefs. So they decided to leave Holland, go try to get permission from the King of England to go to one of the colonies in the Americas with the intention that they would go over there, make enough money from fishing to send back to pay for their voyage. So they got their permission, they started off with two ships, one ship went down, they ended up cramming all onto one ship, the trip was treacherous they thought they were going to land in the opening of the hudson river in what is now new york city but they actually landed much further north in what is now modern day cape cod once they came ashore it was around november they came upon what looked like different graves or storage units and they dug those up and began finding corn, bowls, other supplies, so they took those with them. There actually were Native Americans still left in this area that had saw them. A fight broke out amongst the two, and actually nobody was injured in that fight. The pilgrims went back into their ship and continued selling more inland to when they finally land on what is now called Plymouth Rock. They were very surprised that when they got on land, they found a settlement that they could just basically walk right into and start living because there were already houses, there were more buried corn that they were able to try to harvest. But again, this is in the month of December. We're starting into a New England winter, which is absolutely atrocious. At winter's end, 44 settlers would be dead from bad conditions. In March, they were surprised when a man named Samoset walked into New Plymouth, greeting them in English. He told them they were building on top of a village called Patuxet, whose residents had all died from the recent epidemic. It belonged to the Wampanoag, and their chief, Massasoit, was watching them. The settlers were eager to trade, so five days later, Samoset returned with furs and companions, including Tisquanto. Known famously as Squanto, he had come to tell them in perfect English that Massasoit had arrived. 
After years of dealing with Englishmen, the Sachem did not trust the newcomers. Edward Winslow was sent to be a hostage and declared the settlers' peaceful intentions. Satisfied, Massasoit walked into New Plymouth and was regally greeted by the governor. A peace treaty was created, ensuring mutual protection if attacked by enemies. With the help of Squanto, New Plymouth settlers began to fare better. He taught them how to grow crops and was absolutely vital as an interpreter. To the separatists, he was a gift from God. But in fact, Squanto had been kidnapped from Patuxet in 1614 and shipped to Spain to be sold into slavery. He ended up in London at the home of a merchant who taught him English and arranged for Squanto's return to the Dawnland in 1619. But Patuxet was now gone, wiped away by the epidemic. Massasoit took him in with suspicion because of his years abroad, but needed a translator to parlay with the newcomers. He eventually sent his warrior Hobamok to live among the settlers and keep an eye on Squanto. By fall, the settlers had a bountiful harvest and a feast was held to celebrate. Part of their celebration was them going out and shooting their musket. Well, the musket's carried a sound pretty far away. The chief hears it, thinking that something may be wrong. He gathers 90 of his warriors and they head towards the pilgrims' new Plymouth. Once they arrive, they realize that nothing is wrong and the pilgrims, shocked to see 90 men and the chief, ultimately say, hey, sit down with us and enjoy this harvest. There actually wasn't enough food there, so the Native Americans went and killed killed five deer and they feasted for three days. Now again, the myth is that this happened year after year. This did not happen year after year. In the writings that we have, there is no mention of Thanksgiving whatsoever. It was more akin to a fall harvest. And the reason why the pilgrims would have been okay with this and not okay with something like Christmas was that in the Bible's Old Testament, the Jewish people did celebrate a fall harvest. So this would have aligned with their beliefs and they wouldn't have thought it as too painful pagan to do this. The pilgrims and the Native Americans realized more settlers were starting to show up and they were heading towards the colony of Massachusetts Bay. So the pilgrims trying to keep their treaty actually went up to Massachusetts Bay and kept the new colony members back from interfering with the Native Americans. Now unfortunately this did not last long and the Puritans that were landing in Massachusetts colony were very hostile to the Native Americans and because of this lots of blood was shed. Now, now, what is very controversial and what a lot of the Native American people say that the true beginning of Thanksgiving actually happens in 1637 at the green corn ceremony. So Native Americans also, like other peoples of the world, had their own fall harvest and typically for a lot of different tribes, it was called the green corn ceremony. Well, at this one particular celebration, the Massachusetts colony invades them and completely slaughters all of them, which is roughly estimated to be about 700. The Massachusetts Bay governor at that time actually records what happens. They talk about setting the native people's houses on fire while they're still aside, that you can smell the stench of them burning. Absolutely atrocious and you can understand why Native American people would not be very happy about this part of history. Now, where Thanksgiving gets tied to that is the day after the governor signs a declaration of giving thanks for what he viewed as winning over the Native American people. And he said that from that day forth for a hundred years, it should be celebrated as Thanksgiving. So going forward, it was typically up to each colony's governor when they would decree a day of Thanksgiving. This didn't always happen to fall in November. It could have been October or anywhere in the year when the governor thought that there was some reason to give thanks to God. Now moving forward, another notable documentation that we have of a colony celebrating Thanksgiving was the Massachusetts colony. In 1775, the Boston Gazette puts out an article for the colony to celebrate a day of Thanksgiving on a Thursday in November. In 1777, after the American Revolution has come to a close and the Americans have defeated the British, the Continental Congress and their leader, George Washington, issue a proclamation of Thanksgiving for the completion of the war. It said that they should set aside the date of December 18th for a solemn day of Thanksgiving. Now, this continued all the way until 1784. It wasn't until November 26th of 1789 that George Washington proclaimed that to be 
the day for all 13 colonies to celebrate a day of Thanksgiving. Now, it was up to each individual colony if they wanted to abide by that or not. And they typically did, but it was not still a national holiday like we would think of today. The colony very well could skip it and celebrate it at their own time, or they could celebrate, like many of them did, multiple Thanksgiving throughout the year. President Adams and Madison continued this tradition, while Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams did not. John Quincy Adams and Thomas Jefferson were very much advocates of separation of church and state, and this holiday was giving thanks to God in their eyes, and that was not something that the government should be sponsoring. So there were no federally mandated days of Thanksgiving. In 1815, James Madison put forth a proclamation for a national day of prayer and Thanksgiving for the end of the war of 1812. Now, nothing happened in regards to a president putting out any more Thanksgiving proclamations all the way until Abraham Lincoln in 1863. What actually started encouraging Abraham Lincoln to eventually do that was a lady by the name of Sarah Hell. She was an editor for a magazine ultimately bought and called Godey's Ladies Books. Now in these books, starting off in November, she would always write an essays explaining the importance of celebrating Thanksgiving. Ultimately, as she revved up her campaign, she started attaching it to the end of every single book that went out. Ultimately, they weren't powerful enough to make this happen, so Sarah went to each individual governor, wrote them letters, as well as other elected officials. She gets the eye of one of Abraham Lincoln's men who gives it to him, and he sees this and thinks that this would be a great idea to bring the country together during and after the Civil War. It's interesting to note that at this point in time, Thanksgiving had not been associated whatsoever with the Pilgrims as far as the federal level goes. But around this time, the manuscript of Plymouth Plantation was actually published, and inside of that was the first account of that meal that the Pilgrims and the Native Americans had together. During the 19th century, Americans were really fascinated with the Puritans and the Pilgrims of the past. So when this surfaced, this story really latched on because they already had an innate fascination with it. When Abraham and Sarah had read this, they thought, oh, this would be great for the Civil War. If the Pilgrims and the Native Americans could come together and have a feast, so can the North and South. So Abraham Lincoln issues the proclamation. The presidents after Abraham Lincoln continued this tradition with the exception of Andrew Johnson, who decreed it to be the first Thursday in December, which was in 1865. Then again, in 1869, under President Ulysses S. Grant, the holiday was moved back to the third Thursday of December. In 1890, Princeton and Yale realized that this holiday, since people were getting it off, would be a great time to have their annual football game. In 1921, Massachusetts actually erects a statue of Chief Massasoit and labels him as a protector and preserver of the Pilgrims. In 1920, a department store in Philadelphia called Gimbel Brothers started their first Thanksgiving parade. In 1924, Macy's actually followed this and it was rumored that they were trying to upstage the other department store. But the truth is, it was sponsored by Macy's employees and their families who were actually very thankful because many of them had recently immigrated to the United States and were thankful for the life they had made here. An interesting little note about that, the balloons originally around that time were released at the end of the parade. They would just cut them loose and let them go straight up into the sky. It wasn't until an airplane almost crashed into one that Macy's decided, this is a bad idea, we probably should not do this again. Also in 1924 was the first time that Native Americans became US citizens. In 1934, the National Football League starts jumping into the Thanksgiving mix with the Chicago Bears and the Detroit Lions starting their annual Thanksgiving game. In 1939, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided that he was gonna move Thanksgiving up a week in the hopes that it would help the economy. They thought that by giving the Christmas shopping season an extra week, this would allow consumers to spend more money and the economy would bounce upward for, from it. This was not true. It actually had the reverse effect and the economy went down. People were incredibly confused. Certain states refused to uh, follow the new Thanksgiving that he had decreed and continued with the old, while some states celebrated both. It was all called Thanksgiving and it was a huge mess. It wasn't until 1941 when FDR in Congress decided that Congress should pass a law making the next and every Thanksgiving thereafter to be on the fourth Thursday of every November. In 1947, President Truman actually started the tradition of pardoning turkeys, which presidents still do 
true to this day. So in conclusion, Thanksgiving is really more of a Frankenstein holiday that has taken a lot from the past and has been shaped uniquely as an American holiday. And because of that, there's going to be a lot of strong emotions. Some people are gonna hate the holiday, some people are gonna absolutely love the holiday. I believe it's important to know what happened in the past, and unfortunately, a lot of us were taught something that we believe to be true and never really thought to look deeper into it because it makes sense in our psyche. And that's why the story prevailed because it was a good story. And for the most part, if we're trying to remember something in history, we save it better by a story format. And that's why we have what we do today. Going forward, I think that we all can come together and continue evolving this holiday into something that's inclusive for all and where everybody in the United States feels included respected, loved, and cherished. I know that I'm thankful for you watching this and I hope that you have an amazing Thanksgiving if you choose to celebrate it. Also, if you learned anything in this, let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And most importantly, you do you, I'll do me, and I'll see you next Friday.